Welcome to Contract Use Past, Present, and Future. Uh, here's some copyright stuff I was told to put in here. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction, then I'm going to talk about sort of what we mean at Bloomberg and what I mean when I say, when I, when I talk about contracts. I'm going to talk about the sort of stuff we do with contracts and we might do in the future. I'm going to go into a bit about what SG1, SG21 is likely to um, move forward with and how they're doing and how we will interact with them in terms of getting contracts back into the language, and then a brief conclusion. So who am I? I have been a software developer all century. I have a purple house, or at least I have a very small part of my house, which is purple on an overcast day. And I'm hoping when I get home, the rest of it is purple. Um, you can see the scaffolding, because they're putting siding up right now. Uh, this is my first time presenting at CPPCon. It's my first time presenting at a conference, so please be gentle with me. Uh, I've been at Bloomberg LP since 2017. I joined the BDE team in 2018. That's our core library development team. Uh, the first task I was given was to attempt to get our assertion facility better so that we could make modifications to it and deploy it and do a bunch of stuff with it. I think they were trolling me by just giving me this task. Um, but we got something out. We worked. Uh, and the next thing I did was start participating in WG21 to get language level contracts to a point where it would be usable for the same kind of stuff. Um, that didn't go so well. Contracts got taken out of the language. So now I'm participating in SG21 with that purpose. So to start, I'm going to go over what do we mean by contracts? What do we mean by English contracts? And what do we mean by putting contracts into code? So at the most general sense, a contract is an agreement between two parties. But really, we we're talking about software contracts, which are really generally an agreement between a library writer and the client of that library. We generally render them in English, something like this. This is how we would render a contract in, uh, on my team. Um, you say what the function would do. So in this case, it's a binary search function. We talk about we return a pointer to an element between the specified begin and end that is greater than or equal to the specified val, or end if no such value exists. This function will perform no more than log, it, log distance begin end comparisons. And the behavior is undefined unless begin and end is a contiguous sorted range. So. The second part, this the behavior is undefined unless begin and end is a sorted range. Those are the preconditions to get this function to behave properly. And when we say this, we form this in the way of saying this is undefined behavior. Now that's a very loaded term. It's very complicated to understand. The standard itself defines undefined behavior this way as behavior for which this documented impo document imposes no requirements. After this in the standard, there's a big note where it describes all the things it doesn't require of things that have undefined behavior. And it certainly doesn't limit itself to that. If the standard doesn't say what it's going to do, you can pretty much get any effect. This can lead to lots of surprises and time travel. Um, when we say this in a contract on a function, what we're really specifying is what we call library undefined behavior, where the library writer gives no guarantee to the client what the light, what the function is going to do if they do not meet the requirements that, that, that are specified there. I'm quoting John Lakos here, or paraphrasing him really, he, he's the one who's tried to give this definition of library undefined behavior and distinguish this from language undefined behavior. We also often call them soft undefined behavior and hard undefined behavior. Um, when you have library undefined behavior, often it leads to language undefined behavior if the contract is violated. But Contracts in general is a tool, and assertions and defensive programming are a way in which we can take library undefined behavior and have some control over it while still not giving callers of our function a way to have expectations of what our function is going to do explicitly when they do violate our contract. In general, we want to treat any violation of a, of a, of a precondition as a bug that needs to be addressed, not something that can be worked around. So again, back in our contract, this behavior is undefined unless begin end is a contiguous sort of range. That's our precondition for what, it, for what you have to do to get some, any of the other behavior out of this function. So that's our precondition. We also specify our post conditions on what this function is going to return. We specify some essential behavior of this function. This function will perform no more than log distance begin end comparisons. Um, and in general, this fully specifies what classifies for our contract for, for our function, what we consider to be a bug when using this function and what not. So any violation of this contract is a bug. In some sense, any bug is a contract violation, but possibly no one has written that contract down yet. So what can we do with these functions? What can we do with these contracts? What parts can we check? Parts might be checked with simple C++ expressions. Parts 
might have readable re might have readable representations we can't really implement. So saying is reachable from, we can't really implement it necessarily, but we can still state it and understand it. Parts might be statements that are beyond the scope of what we're saying about a single function. Like the statement of essential behavior, it's really about, if we were to, if we were to state it in terms of sort of algorithmic complexity, is a general statement about many calls to the function, not necessarily something you can reliably check on a single call to the function. And I just hit a bad button. So parts that we can render in code, we could put simple Boolean expressions, so begin and end, we can say a bunch of stuff about them that should be true, begins not null, ends not null, begins less than or equal to end. We can say a bunch of stuff about this post condition if we give the return value a name that's let greater than or equal to begin, less than or equal to end, it's either equal to end or it's greater than or equal to the value. Um, we can say it's sorted. Now this is another one, we say we have some function is sorted that takes a two pointers and compares everything in the list that's a different in structure from a lot of the others because is sorted actually, were we to actually evaluate that expression would violate our essential behavior and doing a whole lot more comparisons than we promised to do. We can say, like I said, things you couldn't necessarily implement like is reachable from because if this is a contiguous range, begin and end have to form a range where you can increment begin until you get to end. And if begin and end are not in pointing to the same region of memory, you hit undefined behavior even attempting to check that. There's no way to do that within the language. Things like this function will perform no more than log distance begin and comparisons, unless you add in some whole other facility to track how many comparisons you're doing, strange things that you don't have implicitly, this is not something you can really readily express. So really, for the most part, we're gonna focus on these contracts that can be checked with functions we can define, these things that we can validate um, and what we can do with those. So the real question then is, what can we do with contracts? Now, there's a dream a lot of people who came to WG21 to get contracts into the standard had. A lot of people came with the goal of saying, we wanna make C++ into a language where you can prove things. You can take a piece of software, Lisa's raising her hand right now, because I think she's a big proponent, she's a big reason that, a big driver for trying to get the language to the point where you can write your program, you can encode your contracts in some way, and then you can point something at your program and say, I'm going to be able to prove that this program is correct, and then when I run it, because I've proven it's correct, I know none of my contracts are being violated. This requires encoding your contracts completely, encoding all of your preconditions, all of your postconditions, all of your essential behavior in some way that the compiler, your proof system is going to understand. Then you can go and statically prove everything. For every function, Every, every simple function that doesn't call something else, it's got some preconditions, it's got some postconditions. You prove that it satisfies all of its essential behavior, it satisfies all of its postconditions. For bigger functions that call other functions, you use the fact that you're calling functions properly with their preconditions, you prove you're about satisfying their preconditions, then you take the postconditions of those functions and you use those postconditions to prove other things. You build up a whole, a whole hierarchy of proofs and eventually you prove your whole program works and then you profit. Now, the question is what kind of profit are you going to get from this kind of proof? You now have a way in which you can, if you had a way in which you could encode everything, if you had a way in which you could prove everything, you could do a lot of great stuff. The one side of the big benefits you can get out of this is less bugs. If your compiler has identified any violated contracts, you quickly at compile time know whenever you make a mistake. Every edge case that you needed to think through, your compiler will tell you about. You don't have to wait until runtime to find out about it. All the assumptions that you're making as you're writing your code, anytime you look at your code and you go, hey, I think this should be true here, and I'm gonna start working as if this is true, you put that in your contract, you're comp you, put, you encode that in some way using some kind of contract facility, and then your compiler is gonna tell you if that assumption was wrong. You'll have documented it for your users, for anyone who's reading your code, um, mostly, the big benefit is that if your code were to compile and be proven correct, it doesn't have any bugs that are contract violations. And in general, if there's a bug that's not a contract violation, it just means you didn't write down that particular contract that you needed to have. So this gives you code with no bugs. So the other big goal, the other big benefit of this is less heat generation. Your code gets faster. If you're not doing any of the checks because they've been all checked by your compiler, you don't have to spend time at runtime doing those checks. If you, your, every bit of knowledge you give to your compiler lets the compiler generate better code. We've seen lots of talks at CppCon about this. Every time someone talks about built-in assume, every time someone talks about 
micro benchmarking and performance things, they tend to be talking about what happens when you give the compiler more information and how can it then generate better things like removing excess branches, use automatic factorization, all sorts of great stuff that can only happen when the compiler can know this stuff is true. Now, if the compiler is proven at all, if the compiler proves every contract you have is true, the compiler can then itself also leverage that information to generate all sorts of better code and smaller code, faster code. This is the, the real big benefit that I think attracts a lot of this C++ community out of those, outside of those who are really concerned with code correctness to the idea of getting contracts into the language. Because it's really only once it becomes an embedded language feature that we can start seriously having tooling focus a lot on improving code whenever it can see contracts aren't being violated. So now let's talk about how we realize parts of that dream. And this starts with a trigger warning because there's going to be macros coming. These offend a lot of people. These are, however, the only way in which we can accomplish a lot of this stuff without a language feature. Part of why we're seeking to make this a language feature is to remove the need for macros for this facility. So Bloomberg's been doing this for 15 years. We've been using these macros for 15 years. I'm going to be going deep, dive, deep diving now into what our macros are, why we've constructed them the way they are, and how we've gotten to where we are. Um, you can see in the BD open source repository the actual implementations of the, func the macros I'm talking about and how, they're how they work and see all the things I'm talking about and what I'm, building, what I'm going to be building up to. I'm going to let John take a picture of this frame. So, first question I have is, what do you do if you can't prove that a contract is being followed? You can experiment. You can perform a test to see if the contract is being followed. If it is, you can proceed as if it's been followed and move on. If it is not, you, can have, you know that you have identified a bug and you can address the fact that you've identified a bug properly. So we can get less bugs by checking our code. We'll start to build up to that. Well, what's the first benefit we can have of starting to encode our contracts into our, into our code in some way? I'm going to start with a simple assert macro, takes a predicate, and does nothing. Now, this doesn't really give you a whole lot, but it does give you the fact that you're documenting that at this point in the code where you use, a, where you use the, any point in the code where you use this assert macro, you expect X to be true. Numerous people at WG21 came up to me and said, I would have been perfectly happy if contracts had gotten into the language with no semantics whatsoever, simply so that I could have encode my contracts so that they are documented for the future. We at Bloomberg call this BSLS assert because we have crazy naming conventions, thanks to John. I'm probably going to alternate back and forth between assert and BSLS assert in these slides, mostly for the sake of fitting things onto slides. Um, one of the advantages you can get without even evaluating anything is to avoid something we call code rot. So one of the first things you do when you do this kind of thing is you say, well, instead of just discarding X, let's at least make sure X is a valid predicate. Let's at least make sure it works. Let's put it in an unevaluated context, like a size of. Let's make sure it converts to bool. And then do nothing else with it. Now, at least at this point, you know, if you have ex some, something in that X, like references a member variable, references a function argument, it's not going to immediately get invalidated the first time you change that. You'll know because you'll stop compiling. I wish we had done this originally with BSLS assert because what we actually have is a separate macro to enable this because assert was originally put in to just discard a predicate. With 4,000 developers and hundreds and thousands, millions of lines of code that are dependent on this macro, there's a lot of code out there that now, if we try to enable certain asserts, just does not compile. So we cannot just change blanketly assert to checking the thing, these things compile. So we have make this opt-in. I wish we had at least done this part where instead of just discarding it, we change it to something that requires a semicolon afterwards. This is not as important, but it does prevent a lot of the cases where you have situations where when you change this assert to do something else, it doesn't compile because the semicolon wasn't there. But when it's compiled out completely, it compiles because it's nothing. But for simplicity, I'm mostly just going to write the is nothing variation where we just discard any un unimplemented asserts. But you can assume it looks like a combination of something like this and this. So the question then is, what if we want to actually do something when we assert, when we identify when our, vi when our contracts are being violated? First step to do is just say, well, if there's a bug, 
I don't know how to continue. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to abort. So we have to find our macro like this. If not x, still abort. Again, it'd be nice if we require a semicolon after that assert macro. So we can do this macro hackery of putting it inside a do while false. Um, this will require a semicolon afterwards. It doesn't let you do assert else something else. It protects you in some ways, but it makes the macros a lot uglier to look at. So assume that that's there in our assert macros. I'm not really going to write this that way for the most of the rest of these slides. So for simplicity, this is our starting point. Assert x is just if not x, stood abort. Now, you may have noticed, now that I've defined the macro this way, I'm checking these th this predicate all the time. So the first thing we really want to do is say, I don't actually want to check these predicates all the time. Every contract check that's checking something that you know is being followed is redundant. It's not it shouldn't necessarily be there in every build. So it might be nice to be able to say, well, sometimes I want to do nothing. Sometimes I want to check and abort. So maybe we'll use NDebug for that. And this is essentially what C programmers and C++ programmers have been using for decades. This is C assert in every way, shape, and form. But we're going to try and do a little bit more than that. So let's break this apart into the different things we try and do with assert and the different ways in which we try and control assert. So I'm going to find an assert imp macro, which is what happens when we want to say, I have a predicate and I want to assert that it is true. So, and if it's not true, I want to do something crazy like abort. Another one, assert disabled imp, which is I have a predicate and I do not want to evaluate it or do anything functional with it. Then we have some simple control. We're going to define assert level assert, which is the thing to say that my assertion level, my asserts should be on. And then if it's not set, we disable our asserts. So then let's look a little bit about at assert imp and what it's actually doing. Right now, if we violate this predicate, we're just going to go poof. And std abort will be called. We're not going to get told what went wrong. We're not going to get a problem. We might get a core dump that gives us some help, but that's generally not the quickest solution. It'd be nice to at least print that some assertion failed, or even better, capture the line number, capture the file name, print that out nicely. But then last week on XKCD, I got a lot of messages from many, many different people who knew I work on contracts a lot telling me that, XACD had actually published a, published a comic. It's essentially someone running into a program that hit an assertion violation, where the programmer then decided on assertion violations to lament about the fact that they're a bad programmer. Now, I'd like to satisfy this guy's needs of saying, well, whenever I have an assertion violation, I want to, I want to express how bad of a person I am or tell you I'm really not sorry. So really, we want to give different control to different people of how what to do when um, assertions are violated. So instead of calling std abort only, why don't we add a facility to say, let's have a pluggable violation handler. We've got some general static function that says invoke violation handler. We pass it the file name, the line number, the expression that failed, uh, or the stringification of the expression that failed. Um, in practice, we actually found it's more useful and more forward thinking to sort of wrap that up in an object, pass that through. Um, this also helps in trying to integrate with the language itself once we do get language level asserts. Um, we also have chosen to leave aborting up to that violation handler as well. So the violation handler becomes a point where we can choose to say, what do we do? How do we report? Also, do we abort? Do we continue? What do we do? Um, invoke violation handler does nothing but says, say, get the static violation handler and call it with the violation. XKCD might have created a custom violation handler like this one, printf a bunch of stuff. I elided most of it because it's not going to fit on a slide that you can read. And then in main, that XKCD app would go and set its violation handler to that violation handler. Then when that assert got hit, all that stuff would print out for the user. There's lots of stuff a violation handler can do. Primarily, a violation handler's purpose is to notify in different ways to the user, something went wrong. So you can do it through a custom logging framework if you're willing to trust that that's going to work after an assertion violation. It can do a GUI message. I think many of us, doesn't happen as often now, but many of us have seen the abort retry fail pop up, come up in a Windows application. That's generally an assertion violation happening within your Windows, within your Windows application. 
You can do all sorts of hardware notifications. If you're running on an embedded system, you may not have a logging framework. You may, printf may not do anything, but you may have some instruction you can call that makes a really big red light shine somewhere. That might be what your assertion should be doing. So you can do different things in terms of flow control in addition to that. You could abort. One thing we found really useful in some cases for debugging things, you sleep. <laughs> now this sounds not tremendously useful, but if you have a complicated assertion you're trying to debug, if you don't know how to reproduce it, say it takes hours to get to, and you haven't been able to identify what state puts you in there, you put this assertion violation handler in there, in, into your program, you run your program, you get to that assert, program will log something saying, hey, I have a, I have a, I've hit an assertion, then it will go to sleep. Then you attach your runtime debugger to this application. You can poke at variables. You can see what's going on. This can really help in a lot of different situations. You can throw an exception. Now, this is an interesting one because in general, trying to throw exceptions and trying to, in a place where you're going to catch the exception is implying you can really recover from whatever violation happened. You have a bug. You've done something bad. You don't actually know that it was necessarily your caller that introduced your bug. Your bug may be the result of memory corruption. Your bug may be the result of any number of problems. This just happens to be the spot where you have caught it. But if, as a policy, you actually never catch exceptions, throwing the exception might be a good way to handle, handle assertion violations because that does give you a way to do sort of custom unwinding based on what was actually happening in the thread where the assertion happens. You may have resources you absolutely need to release before you shut down your application. You may want to at least try to, even if you're in a, even if you're bad state. So you don't necessarily throw the exception because you expect to recover from the assertion violation, but you may want to throw the exception because you want to unwind whatever state you have and then terminate when the uncaught exception exits your threat. So as I said, you could also try to recover in some way after an assertion violation, but that often means you're making gross assumptions about why you violated your assertion, and that can be very dangerous. In general, what happens with this assertion violation is something you really want to be deciding on a global scale for your application, really at the start of main. At main sets up a violation handler. That's going to define how you deal with bugs in your program. And for the most part, the safest thing to do is log something in a way that is going to get noticed and abort. So now we come to the question of what to do with checks and the checks that we can't necessarily evaluate all the time. So far, we have a facility where we can turn them all on or we can turn them all off. And for some checks, that's not a big deal. This begin, end, begin less than end, these are checking simple predicates on things that are already in, your, in registers or in your cache. These are almost going to be immeasurably small to try to detect that they are happening. Some are not and are the exact opposite. Checking in your binary search that your range is a sorted range every time you call binary search, and yes, Lisa thinks that that's not necessary, is going to take, make your binary search linear, no longer logarithmic, and basically make any program that heavily depends on this being a binary search unrunnable on any significant size um, data set. So here's where we broke down and said, well, let's take a search and categorize them into different asserts based on how fast we think they run. In BSL and BDE, we have three different assertion macros, assert opt, assert, and assert safe, basically broken down into things that are really, really fast, things that are fast enough you can run them most of the time, and things that are really, really slow. In the language, in the standard, what we were about to get, what we were about to get standardized broke into two, just two levels, and in hindsight, two levels is probably sufficient things that are fast enough to run most of the time, and things that are too slow to run, except when you need to absolutely run them, but will break your complexity requirements in other ways. So we have a linear scale of enabling these. We have four different macros now. Assert level none, assert level opt, assert level assert, and assert level safe. They're mutually exclusive. Um, there's other things that go into configuring these if you don't set these explicitly. I'm not going to go into that here. Um, if they're not defined, you get assert. And then, based on these, we define the assert macros. If assert level none is set, then all of the assert macros are disabled in. At opt, only assert opt is, is assert imp, and the rest are disabled. Similarly for assert, similarly for assert safe. We actually structure the header 
more so per macro. So each macro checks which things are defined. Assert opt will only be enabled if um, or assert opt will only be enabled if one of the assert levels other than none is set. Assert will only be enabled if assert or safe is set. And assert safe will only be enabled if assert safe assert level safe is set. And this is basically what Bloomberg, this is the basic form of what Bloomberg's assertion checking facility was from 2005 to 2018. The names changed a little over time, the structure changed a little over time, but these macros were there and were in use across all of Bloomberg's code base, checking preconditions throughout our entire standard library, checking preconditions throughout huge amounts of other code written at the company, catching a lot of bugs, stopping a lot of th bad things from happening, and generally doing good. But there were issues we had with sort of dealing with the life cycle of assertions in that wide of a code base and at that scale. So just to motivate why we wanted to change some things. Like I said, we originally said opt should be for your 5% most critical tests. Assert should be for the level, for, for most of your tests, but maybe 90% that are fast enough to run most of the time, but aren't a great performance hit. And your safe assert should be for anything that is more than two times the size of the, the cost of running your function, or it might have been 10 times, but it wasn't algorithmic in, in, in nature. It was anything that's going to have a significant uh, uh, increase, even constant time increase in the cost of your function. Really, in practice, you don't really need opt, or you really want to only use opt for the asserts that are, you're 100% sure or either should never really be turned off in practice or are so fast they will never have a measurable cost. Almost everything else that doesn't impact algorithmic complexity should be at the assert level. And your safes should really only be for the things that are too algorithmically slow to execute and still meet your contract. Changing any of these asserts from one level to another, though, is very hard. If you have an assert safe in an application and all of your clients downstream are running only with asserts checked, you cannot safely change that assert safe into an assert without fully testing every one of those clients to be sure they weren't sort of innocuously violating that assert safe check. Even in bin search, if you pass to a standard bin search algorithm, you, uh, unsorted contiguous range, it's gonna still give you back a result. It's gonna give you back a result from in that range. It's generally gonna give you back a result that is greater than the element before it. It's not necessarily gonna give you the um, smallest element that you wanted because this range isn't sorted, but in many cases that element might be perfectly usable for what you were doing. You didn't notice you were broken. You didn't notice you had forgotten to sort your range. And if you turn that check on, if you suddenly start validating that your binary search is only getting sorted arrays, every client that's doing that is going to start crashing. In a perfectly unit tested world where you could say I'm going to flip a switch, test every bit of program on enough stuff that I can be confident that my production workflows are all going to be, are never going to hit a case that I didn't hit in my tests. You could try this. You could say, well, I passed all my tests so I can switch it. Bloomberg is not that kind of world. We have millions of lines of code. We have thousands of developers of many varying skill levels. Um, we are not comfortable with saying that. We also have a very complicated production environment with huge numbers of different configurations and workflows. It would, in practice, based on how we have chosen to build a lot of our systems, be impossible to test every possible production setup with every possible production workflow and see that any of these changes are safe to make. So the only thing we'd ever feel comfortable with is if we knew that these checks were not being violated, and then we could move on with changing the level into something that is actually going to abort. So the other thing is, what levels do you actually want to run your code at? In development, you generally want your asserts on. Sometimes you want your assert safes on so you can catch your bugs sooner. In your unit tests, you want your asserts on, hopefully. You say, probably also want your safes on. But at this point, you also want to start making sure you are also unit testing with the same level you're going to be using in production. Because you want to be sure that there's no nothing that's going to creep in and break with your production build prior to deploying there. In beta testing, you probably want your assert ops on, originally we would say. In production, the same thing. 
And we really want to be much more aggressive than that. Like I said, you want your safes on, you want a unit test with assert safes on, and another round of unit tests with only the assert ops on. Same for beta testing. Even in production, you may want asserts on. We always run with asserts on in, in most of our production systems because it's generally a case of measuring risk versus reward. We'd much rather have lower risk, we'd much rather find out bugs sooner than to have a bug silently go by, deliver bad data to our clients, and lose lots of money. Because losing lots of money counteracts any amount of gain we might have had by saving performance and spending a little less on CPUs. Um, but this is basic, and this is basically where we are today in terms of what we have deployed throughout most of Bloomberg. Moving these things is hard. We've tried this with a few other things, like we've attempted to add more assertions to our production code base. We have a string implementation, like I said, we provide a standard library to the rest of Bloomberg. Um, we attempted to add an assert in our string destructor that seemed completely innocuous to us. Check that the string is still uh, null terminated. This got rolled, checked in, this got started rolling out, and hundreds of applications started hitting assertion failures all over the place because everyone was messing with that string buffer, everyone was doing bad things. This assert got pulled out, I still don't think it has been put back in. Um, I think there's a lot of fear and pain resulting from that first attempt. And Luckily, this was caught very quickly and loudly before really hitting production very hard, I think. But again, we had no way to say, well, this is something that should have been true all along. We, our written contracts all said, don't mess with this buffer. Standard string does says, it's undefined behavior to mess with this buffer. But everyone was still doing it. It was working for them. And no one was really happy when we started saying, we're going to enforce this. We had another major case where we were attempting to change the internal structure of one of our time, date time classes. And that led to us trying to interact with the fact that lots of people were doing all sorts of unkosher things with our date time classes, like mem setting them all to zero, or directly copying them into databases and then loading them back from databases later. Um, this meant we had to start trying to do some things to check every time one of our date time classes started to access itself, is it in a valid state? Is its actual memory there? Because we had a case where we could no longer enforce any of our invariants for this date time class because we found many of our users were doing things that prevented us from doing that. In the, at the time, we basically added a bunch of checks and a bunch of logging, and we monitored those checks and logging. It would have been nice if we'd been able to just say, let's assert that this is true because it's a bug if you have mem set this date time class that now no longer has a default constructed state of all zeros to be zero. <clears throat> the other major thing we wanted to do, like I said, was change levels of assertions. When we changed our general policy, we wanted to make a bunch of our assert safes into asserts. <clears throat> Doing that change is a long, complicated process. It's unsafe. <clears throat> mm, sorry. Similarly, if you want to change an assert into an op, you have the same problem. If you're deploying to places where you, that check was previously off and you wanted to turn it on, you have no way to know safely that you're not going to just cause programs downstream to crash when this happens. Also, when we started trying to say, we want asserts on everywhere, we needed a way to say, how do we migrate from having only assert opt on in production to having assert on in production? Every one of you will hopefully have to deal with exactly these problems in 2023 or maybe 2026, because all of you will hopefully be taking large legacy code bases and attempting to use language level contracts in your code and you're gonna be introducing new contracts into old code that might be following those contracts, but might not. And you don't want your production systems to just crash when yesterday, without the contract written in them, they worked fine. So what was the first thing we tried to do to try to start getting asserts out there and changing assertion levels? Um, a lot of people deployed, assert, deployed their programs, and in Maine, they set a violation handler that didn't abort, it just returned. This meant that they didn't care if we went and changed assertion levels. They didn't care. It was fine because they might get some logging. Something might go wrong. Uh, something might get, they'd be informed of a bug, but it, it wouldn't bring their system down if any of these changes happened. Um, this requires that someone in main actually do this. It's not necessarily something you can do at the library level where you have hundreds, of thousands, hundreds or thousands of different client applications, all of which have their own main, all of which might be setting their assertion handlers differently. 
This means that also, is there a reason that just blinked? Anyway, um, this means that also new bugs might go unnoticed if they're only getting logged. People don't read their logs. People will often let logs, especially the spammier their logs get, go by all the time. They won't fix every bug that happens. They won't keep their logs clean. And generally that can lead to major problems when those logs happen and major problems that look really bad when you can say, well, this went wrong. An assertion found out this went wrong. The people who built the application chose to have a continuing violation handler that just logged when that went wrong. And because it went wrong, we delivered really bad data to a client who then turned around, lost a lot of money, came to us for that money. And we had to look through it and say, oh, we should have known about this because we logged about it a month ago. But we only logged. We didn't crash. We didn't do something drastic. If we had crashed, we would have found out about it and fixed it very quickly. But we were letting a bug through by having a, continuation, a continuing violation handler. We let, this, we let major problems slide. So in general, having blanket continuation from your violation handler is not a safe approach. So what was the next major step we tried to take to get assertions changing? We created a much more smart violation handler that could be configured to say, these assertions can be control, can, can, can allow continuation, these won't. It would track how many assertions had failed. It would have different, um, it would log only based on how many times something had failed, or different time frames. It did all sorts of great stuff. But this required a lot of configuration. Um, it logged in different ways. It was still a little unsuccessful in getting changes out there. It required a lot more cooperation from main than the other one. It required using that specific violation handler, configuring things appropriately. There was no way to indicate just in the code, I have just changed this assertion from one level to another. Treat it with the gloves, with, with, with gentle hands. Don't, don't just, via, don't just crash if this, uh, with this assertion until we have some comfort level that it is good to treat at its new level. And so this thing was rarely used. I think one group used it, but it never really made, it, made its way out there. It never really took traction, and it didn't really get us to the point where we could start saying, how do we change our things? So the actual step we've taken is something we call BSLS review. Like I said, this was how they trolled me when I joined my team by saying, go implement this. Um, no explicit cooperation from main is needed. Contracts instead are marked essentially as a new contract, a change contract in code. And we have build time controls to also take batches of, batches of contracts that are at other levels and set them as new for a particular deployment. So an overview, what it really is, is a complete parallel structure to our assert facility. It has a separate violation handler that instead of defaulting to aborting, defaults to just logging. It allows for a life cycle where you say, I have an assert safe, I want to change it to an assert. What I first do is I change it to a review. And a review is going to always be on anytime an assert is on in most of our builds. And it will, not, it will still check. It will log if it's being violated, but won't bring an application down. So this way, as a library developer, we get to follow through with this life cycle going from assert safe to review to assert. And without touching it, telling any of our clients, telling all the thousands of applications above us to, to do anything other than rebuild with a new version, they, we can get our assertions changed. They all log to a common facility. We're able to monitor those logs. We have a whole system set up to where any time a review log comes out, they get notified, a ticket gets created. We can monitor to see what reviews have been hit. And we can know at a certain point, OK, our production systems have not hit this particular review in the last x months. So now we can change it to an assert. And now we know that we are preventing that from reintroducing new bugs in the future. Alternately, the same thing. I don't know what I did with that format. Um, alternately, the same thing can be, got, can be used to introduce whole new asserts into a system that weren't there before because they, they had, they've been overlooked before or you're trying to narrow a contract. There's lots of things you can do here where you first start by just introducing a BSLS review safe or a BSLS review. And then once you're confident it's not being hit, you change it to an assert. So like I said, it's just a copy of assert. This is, doesn't even require reformatting because we spent through a lot of work to pick a name with exactly the same number of characters as assert. Um, and as you can see, it calls 
a different violation handler. It uses the same assert violation object here, but um, that's how review imp starts. In truth, we also found it's very useful to not just, uh, when you have a continuing violation handler, to know how many times has that violation handler been hit. Because it's very important not to log on every failure, especially when you have some cases where something might be failing millions or billions, billions of times a second. Turning that into logs will bring your production applications down. So we have a separate violation type that takes account. We keep an atomic int with every review. Uh, we increment that on each violation. And that's what gets passed for review violations. The default violation handler just logs. Uh, logs a stack trace, it returns. Actually just does this on powers of two of the count. Um, there's overflow checking in the real version. It's a little more complicated than this. But fundamentally, this lets us do that. It gives us exponential back off, and I can't spell exponential. Um, again, it has separate controls, separate um, macros to control the review level. They're mutually exclusive. Uh, if you don't set a review level, it just gets the assert level. And for the most part, no one explicitly sets a review level for most, in most situations. Um, in reality, the macro logic is a bit different because review can't reference assert because it's levelized below assert. But fundamentally, this is what it does. It defaults to the assert level. And again, just like assert, if review level is none, all the review macros are disabled. If review level is opt, only opt is, 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 is enabled and the rest are disabled. Same for these. And again, in truth, they're structured just like assert um, to go macro by macro. And then the question comes is, how do we go about changing build levels with review? And here's where assert and review start to interact, and part of why assert depends on review. So let's look at BSLS assert again. At assert level assert and assert level safe, it's enabled, otherwise it's disabled. Now what we've added is, if it's not enabled, but there's a review level set high enough above assert, so if review level review or review level safe is set, then the assert becomes a review. So what this does is it says, if we set our assert level to opt, so only our assert ops are being, are being checked, and we set our review level to review, then all of our things that are at the assert level are being reviewed. So we can deploy that build. Now, this, does, this is something you do as an application developer who wants to say, I have an opt level build that I'm running. I'd rather be running a, an assert level build because it checks more and it's safer and it's better. Um, but I don't want to just deploy that because I'm pretty sure in production I'm breaking a lot of contracts. I need to find out what contracts are breaking. I don't want to tell the team writing my, writing my libraries, go change all of your asserts to reviews. That's not viable because they have a lot of other clients who are actually enforcing those asserts. So what I do is I do a build where I, set my, I keep my assert level at opt, but I set my review level to review and I deploy that. It's going to start checking every single one of those assertions. And again, in our standard library implementation, we have many, many thousands of assertions checking all sorts of things. Every function with a narrow contract checks, it, checks all of its contract. And once I'm comfortable with that, once I'm good with that, 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 my, that I'm not getting a lot of logs telling me I'm violating things, then I can turn around, change my assert level up to assert, take out the definition of BSLS review level review, and now I have changed the level of assertion deployment I have without ever risking all those contract violations actually breaking my system. I get told when they're happening, I get time to go fix them out of line, and in general, I may have been violating contracts. I had bugs in my code, but those bugs weren't hitting me and causing problems that I noticed yesterday. I don't want this change to be the thing that makes them cause problems and unrecoverable problems today. So similarly, assert opt and assert safe, default to review if there's a review level set higher than them, and that's pretty much all that there is to review. So far, it has been a general success. Thousands of BSLS assert safes became BSLS reviews. Um, we've been very cautious about this. We're, again, we're used by thousands of applications. We are very um, conservative in our approach to this, but we made thousands of changes. So far, none of those BSLS reviews have brought any systems down, as far as I'm aware. They have found a good number of bugs, and 90% of them have gone on to become asserts. The rest are sort of a long tail of, these are bugs that people are tracking down, people are trying to fix. Um, again, some of them, like in the time stuff, there's a lot of people doing many different bad things that have to go and fix the bad stuff they are doing before we can make that into an assert. But we're on the road to doing that. 
Um, and a lot of actual bugs have come up. People are doing, have been doing things where they were violating contracts in ways that were innocuous, didn't really cause a problem, but made their code not really do the right thing. One of the first examples that came up, someone was passing to a uh, caching data structure a minimum size and a maximum size backwards. So essentially their caching data structure was never caching anything. This was a performance problem. This was not a, the software worked. It didn't break anything, but essentially all the code they had written that was attempting to take advantage of reusing objects was doing absolutely none of that. And as soon as these uh, the cert safes that had previously been checking, maximum is greater than mi greater than minimum were turned into a cert into reviews. I, we got messages saying, "What did you change? Why did you break?" And we went, "You're passing these backwards." And they went, "Oh, they fixed it." And that assert that review quickly became an assert. Um, so the big takeaway is it's important that we can make a checker review alongside existing asserts. It's important that we can mark this in code not just at the build level, not just externally, because there are times when you're changing a single assert from one level to another, introducing a new one, where you need to mark it as this should be treated differently from a, a regular assertion. It's also important you be able to control at build time what gets treated as a review, what gets treated without aborting. So there's one more question. I'm gonna ask the same question again. What do you do if you can't prove that a contract is being followed? You can believe. You can have faith. This is where you get into leveraging contracts for faster code. So a lot of performance improvements can come from compilers knowing something will be true. A lot of this can actually come with assert by just putting no return on the invoke violation handler. And to some extent, now that we have review and we have no use cases for people putting continuing assert violation handlers in, we're moving towards being able to say the assert violation handler will never be allowed to return normally. When you do this, the compiler sees that if the assert is false, code never continues past that assert when it's checked. And so all the code afterwards can be optimized as if that predicate is true. That does, however, come at the cost of actually evaluating the assert, having the potential branch, having the work, doing the work to say, is this true? If it is, great. If not, go and do something bad and abort. You can skip that cost if you have a lot of faith and a lot of confidence that you're not violating your contract. Built-in assume is essentially how you do that. This, again, depends a lot on the strength of your belief. How confident are you that this is happening? If you get this wrong, in a very gross sense, anything can happen. Bad stuff can happen. Many, you, you, just like there are lots of CPP con talks about all the great things that assuming things can do for optimization, you'll find just as many historical CPP con talks about all the horrible things that happen when you do use built-in assume wrong and when undefined behavior is abused or encountered unexpectedly. Now, assert does give you actually a nice workflow, I think, and we haven't had a chance to really use this in anger that much, but we're starting to get towards where we hope to be able to do so, um, which is once you've run your system with your research checked for a significant amount of time against your production workflow, once you're really confident that all of your assert ops are not being violated, you're really leaving performance on the floor to not just start assuming them. So it'd be nice to be able to say, let's take that, let's turn our assert ops into assumes. So let's add another kind of assert level implementation that says, let's assume the X. There's lots of different ways you can spell it. You can use built-in assume, you can check the predicate and do standard unreachable and sort of hope the compiler is gonna unwind any evaluation of that predicate. You can even without standard unreachable, be, or something like it being available. You can just have blatant undefined behavior. The compiler is free to go and peel that away. This almost got into the standard as assert assume colon x. Um, and hopefully we'll see that come back from SG21 in some kind of concrete way. In BDE, I'm hoping to soon start folding this into assert by sort of adding new assertion levels where you can say, if I'm not gonna check any contracts, I'm gonna turn all my checking off maybe I've reached the level of confidence where I can start turning some of my check contracts into assumes. So when the assert level assume opt is set, your assert ops become assert assumes. Similarly, levels for 
Oh, I didn't get the uh, macros right there. But I'm going to scale of macros to say I'm going to ramp up how much I'm assuming. Now, in most cases, assuming your research safes is probably not the right thing to do because, as I said, this should be predicated on you have running against your production workflow all of your assert safes checked. And in general, checking your assert safes is probably the thing that's going to make your production systems too slow to actually do anything useful. So that's why it's also important to have this fine grained control to say, well, I checked my ops so I can start assuming my ops now because that build has been running for a significant amount of time and I'm comfortable and I'm willing to take the risk for that performance gain. Similarly, you can do that, but importantly in these levels, the higher levels are not assumed. So that's basically the future of where we're hoping to go with BSLS assert. And that basically without the assumed stuff where B Bloomberg's contracts are today. Now I'm going to talk a little about what we're trying to get to everybody who doesn't want to go use BDE. Although you are welcome to go use BDE, it is open sourced, it's on GitHub. Um, and that's getting this into the language itself with SG21. So what happened and why do we have SG21? So coming into Kona, the February um, WG21 meeting, contracts had a number of issues, especially when I started looking at them and trying to say, well, I just did BSLS review, how am I going to use language level contracts to interact with and hopefully re-implement BSLS review just on top of language level contracts and BSLS assert? They had a continuing, continuation was just a global flag. There was no way to control it per contract. And for many people who were involved, even the existence of continuation was contentious. Any unchecked contract was just assumed, which again is dangerous, brings up all the dragons of undefined behavior. Um, Axiom was basically isomorphic in every way that anyone could tell to just being built in Assume, which some people loved and some people thought was absolutely contra contrary to what contracts were for. Um, and a lot of people, when they were looking at the default and audit scale of cost for contracts said, either this is too complicated, I'm never going to use it, or this is too simplistic, I'm never going to use it. Very few people were happy with the just two levels is the right compromise um, for this situation. New, and also on top of that, there were lots of things that a lot of work had gone into defining contracts in the standard, and a lot of it, and the decisions that had gone into that had not been sort of made publicly available. And that's one of the things where hopefully SG21, by going through the process of clearly going through these conversations, will sort of fix at least that problem. So in Kona, in Cologne, numerous papers came to attempt to fix these problems. On Monday, July 15th in Cologne, we worked through a number of papers, we, we talked through a number of papers that were presenting fixes to the way assertions were going to behave and how they could be controlled. Bjarna Strustrup had P1711, which was essentially proposing the smallest fixes to at least fix the every unchecked contract is assumed problem. Uh, I had P1429, which was attempting to say, let's keep everything and add in a way to to get the basic semantics available to people so that they could build their own facilities and do all the stuff that the language wasn't going to be providing. And P1607, which basically said, let's take away default, let's take away axiom, let's take away audit, let's just give you a fancy way of saying C assert, and if you want, also give you the literal semantics so you could build your own facilities. 1607 is actually what EWG voted on. There was more consensus for that than any other contract-related vote I saw in either of my WG21 meetings. Um, it still met with a lot of people responding with, that's great, it might be the right way to go, we're not sure, this is far too late in the standards process to make a change of what we think is that, uh, that drastic of a change. So on Wednesday, July 17th, my anniversary, um, P1823 came through which was remove contracts from the standard. Lots of people came into the room, everyone voted yes. And then on July 20th, my birthday, <laughs> contracts were removed from the standard. And at the same time, SG21 was announced to pursue bringing contracts back. Um, John Spicer, <laughs> should put that in the slide. John Spicer is the um, chair of that group and we're hoping to bring a more a better process to defining contracts and getting them back into the standard and hopefully 
building a lot on what we've already talked about and had over the past few years, so we don't have to really start from scratch. So what's SG21 going to do? SG21 is a very active reflector so far. We have one telecon where we started talking about this stuff. Our first official meeting will be in Belfast. A rough sketch of the plan we're sort of going through is, first we're going to be publicly gathering all the use cases from every SG21 member that we think contracts might need to satisfy. That's been done. Then we're going to start polling everyone in SG21 for which of those many use cases, many of which are not their own, they think should be prioritized, they think are important for them. This is in progress. Um, we're hoping to produce a paper for Belfast uh, that will have a significant number of these responses collated, some basic, basic analysis of what people think of the different use cases. Um, that's all going to be happening over the next few weeks. Once we have that, we're going to be able to gather proposed solutions and then view them in light of those use cases. Um, we're going to propose, I'm personally going to bring P1607 and P1429 versions back uh, with whatever additional features are necessary to meet as many of the use cases as possible. We have published papers that essentially laid out a plan built on top of that previously to get something like BSLS review into the language. That's when we're going to start bringing that forward because the things that BSLS review does are what we hope will satisfy many of the use cases that have been laid out in that uh, in, the, in the use cases document, and we think that there are important use cases to solve. I hope many of the other SG21 member, members will as well. There might be papers bringing totally new syntaxes or totally different levels of scope or different kinds of behaviors to this. This is going to be happening in SG21 over the next few meetings. We'll hopefully review and vote and bring a, cons a paper to EWG that has sort of consensus from SG21 on this really is something that isn't just a union of minimal solutions from a few different groups. It is a solution that meets many of the use cases that people have chosen to prioritize. Um, or, and more importantly, we're not going, or hopefully won't be seeing a lot of people going, well, this doesn't meet my use case, so I don't think it should be part of contracts, which is something that happened a lot in the previous proposal. And I think there's a good chance we will see progress, and we'll see this paper come out, and we'll get to land contracts in the standard. I personally keep thinking of this as WG21, SG21, 2021 because I think that's a good time frame to aim for, for getting a paper that SG21 is happy with, SG21 has some confidence in, and that gets into the standard. <laughs> Sorry, John keeps taking pictures. I can show you the slides later. Um, so we gathered lots of use cases. Uh, all the form are as an X in order to Y, I need to Z. Uh, this will, as I said, hopefully be in a paper for, for Belfast. We have 29 different classes of users and 196 different use cases spelled out in glorious detail. Um, we have another backup paper to that that takes not just short descriptions of each use case and in many cases elaborates at great length on what we mean by those use cases. So the final Belfast paper may be large. Um, some range in fluff, some from very general to very specific. Part of our goal when writing a lot of these use cases was first to make sure no voice was left unheard also have a lot of things that sort of get people in the mood of being accepting. Get people in the mood of saying, yeah, that, that is a good idea. I should be able to write annotations that are succinct and elegant and have a nice syntax. Some of them, I want to ensure overriding methods have the same or wider preconditions. So again, these go at very, level, very different levels of detail. Um, some of them are sort of things even beyond the scope of what we did before. Like, being able to embed contracts into function pointers and std function, making them part of the type system at a much more complicated level, was something that was sort of not on the table at all in the previous standard, in the previous proposals. We're going to see how many people SG1 really prioritize this and how much we want to think about doing this. Personally, I put this as a nice to have because I think it is a huge change that pervades the whole language, but if we choose to do it, that'd be great. Um, so prioritization is happening now. Everyone SG21 is voting. They have until the end of the month, basically, to say for each of those 196 use cases is something not important, nice to have, or a must have. Um, like I said, we'll have these in Belfast. And uh, that's where we are today. Like I said, I've given you a, as much of an overview as I can of what BSLS, certain BSLS, BSLS review provide for doing contract checking. Um, you can go grab the open source BDE and play with it today. And 
how we're hoping to get that to interact with what the language standard provides in the future. Um, and that's it. Any questions? I didn't put a slide that said questions. So. Um, I have a little bit of a question related to some of the comments you made about termination versus continuation. Uh, so I work on a team where we work on a client application that has a very diverse set of production uh, constraints and production environments. Uh, something we found is occasionally we'll have a contract violation, which we only really find once it's in production, and that sort of led to divergent opinions on air handling in general, where there's camps where uh, a function will check its preconditions and terminate if something is wrong. But then there is also a lot of code which is written such that explicitly uses flow control to then return, hey, something's wrong, caller, we have an error, treat this like any other error handling strategy, you figure out what to do. Um, have you seen sort of that latter strategy of uh, contract violation being used as part of flow control in your experiences? And do you have any sort of experiences of whether that's led to some of the same reliability issues you were referring to earlier? Um. So I think you're asking, like, if you build a system that let, that's sort of designed around recovering from contract violations, have I seen that work? Yeah. And I haven't seen it work personally. I think part of it is if you're going to be doing that, you need every piece of code you're deploying to be written with that in mind. So especially once language level contracts come along and you start using libraries that have contracts in them as well. like. Your libraries may not be set up to recover from contracts. Um, so I, I think if you're, if you're diligent about it, top to bottom, then it's something that might be viable. But again, it, it's, it's if you're in a world where you control everything top to bottom and can really enforce that kind of diligence, that you're, you're checking things. I think part of the thing that really makes me uncomfortable about doing that is the number of times that we as a team have seen assertions fail that have nothing to do with the caller of that function, nothing to do with that assertion. It's because far away, someone has gone and overwritten memory and done something bad, and nothing actually triggered until that assertion failed. And if you do that and you sort of try to say, well, I'm going to try to recover, I'm going to try to handle some special error handling logic and then move on, you are sort of just digging yourself into a deeper hole. Now, if you're deploying client applications to desktops, you don't have as much control. You sort of have a lot of trade-offs that are maybe aborting is never going to be the right thing. Maybe you need to show a screen to someone that says, what you want, what do you want to do? But I, I don't know that like, I would ever feel that comfortable in a situation where that was being done unless, again, you were in a very rigid environment where that is all being controlled top to bottom. Thank you. Huh? Oh, and there's another talk tomorrow morning at 9 by a, a co teammate of mine, Slava, Rostislava Klebnikov, where he will be talking a lot about what are the right ways and wrong ways to use assertions and to use contracts. And I think that might actually also have some very interesting points related to what you just said. Uh, hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm curious in your code base, uh, do you guys have any contracts to check to check performance. For example, make sure that the critical part of the code perform quite enough, uh, quite I mean, fast enough, sorry. I I wish we did, but not really. Unit tests. We, we have unit tests that do some basic algorithmic complexity checking. We don't really, we have unit tests, we have, we have tests that we can run to do some actual benchmarking, but we don't really have automated benchmarking. I, I think automated benchmarking is a tricky thing because if you're going to be running your unit tests everywhere, you don't necessarily have a way to say, well, I want my benchmarks to always perform properly on every system that these unit tests might get run. Um, so it leads to a lot of false positives. It leads to a lot of questions like that. Um, but yeah, mostly that kind of thing we lead to conditionally run unit tests that do the testing, do the performance checking, and verify that we're meeting our performance benchmarks, but sort of outside of the assertion framework. For the most part, within our systems, 
we, we really focus on assertions checking for checking preconditions because that's checking that your clients are using you properly for checking that you do the right thing when your preconditions are met and that you satisfy your post conditions and that you perform properly we really philosophically think unit tests are the right thing for that so we actually through our through our code base have very little in the way of assertions that are used for post conditions or essential behavior checking it's mostly preconditions that we're checking thank you sure Hi, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Have you considered ways at the language level or the implementation level to uh, to prevent people having side effects in the predicates? Yes, but it's hard. <laughs> um, and, and one of the biggest reasons why it's hard is there are side effects you really do want to allow from your predicates. You You really want a predicate to be able to log. You don't want your predicate to be necessarily required to get evaluated, it'd be nice at the language level for the language to be able to say, hey, here's a predicate. If I can prove it's going to be true, I'm just going to not check it because I don't need to. Currently, if that predicate were to, like if I just had it with if statements, if that predicate were to have a side effect of any sort, the compiler couldn't just elide the whole thing. It'd be nice if we treated it specially and said, you know what, even if it has side effects, it could be elided, sort of get around that. The way the previous proposal, I had a propo pa another paper that never even saw UWG in Cologne, basically to do exactly that. The way the previous proposal handled this was to say any contra any predicate with side effects whatsoever that has with side effects whatsoever is undefined behavior, which is a very heavy-handed way to get that done. It means the compiler can essentially say, well, you have a logging statement in your predicate, so I'm going to just eat your whole program. No one, when they thought about it more, really felt comfortable with that solution. Something in the middle where you can say, well, I really want to allow side effects that don't affect the concrete state of my program, but not allow side effects that do is a much harder thing to pin down and to, to make do. And the thing is, it opens you this trap of, well, okay, I have side, I, my side effects are memory allocation because I, in order to check, I have to create a set to see that I don't have duplicates in some string. That's really bad to just disallow. But if my side effect is changing the parameters of my function, you do wouldn't want to disallow that. Or changing some global state, you do want to disallow that. So, so far, I haven't seen a good proposal for how to pinpoint these are the checks that should be allowed and these are the side effects that shouldn't. And I lean towards just saying, let them all be allowed. Let the language level contracts say, you're not even guaranteed these are even going to be run. And sort of use that as the teaching tool for people to not depend on those side effects actually happening. Because if you look at it, you're going to go, I think the side effect should happen, but it's in a contract, so I don't know. So I'm going to make sure there's no side effect there. And there's lots of things like once it gets in the language, it's hard to do with a macro. Once it gets in the language, a lot of the stupid side effects you might have, like initializing a variable inside your expression, are things that might just they become very common compiler warnings. Like there's certain things that you can look at but not necessarily standardize as this is wrong. So. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, since these BSL macros are, well, macros, meaning they transform code depending on the assertion level, if I understand correctly, that, cause, that means there's the potential for ODR violations depending on with what contract level yes. a particular translation unit was built with, being linked with, et cetera. Yep. It does, how, did this cause problems during in any way? And would language contracts have the same problem? So with BSLS review, BSLS assert, um, we do definitely have very many mixed, mixed contract level builds. I don't think we've ever identified a problem related to those ODR issues. They have all been benign. Fundamentally, because these are all embedded within um, a, fun a single function, the function gets inlined with one, may get inlined in one place with one um, assertion level. It may get not inlined somewhere else or inlined in a different place with a different assertion level. Those two don't really interact in a way that's going to give you the problems that ODR violations are likely to give, to, to, to give you. We're never changing data structures um, based on these, based on these uh, assertion levels. So, um, 
In terms of language level contracts, I think we do need to address this in some way. And I think it will be, there, there, there's lots of ideas that have come up with and things that we can do. And I think it will be great if we can sort of leverage language level contracts to say, yes, you may want to call the same function with different assertion levels, different contracts enabled or disabled from different places in the same program and have that work. And then it just becomes the compiler's job and the linker's job to make that work. And it may be hard. We have some impl implementation strategies. We have some ideas on how it might get done. But uh, from the standardization perspective, we just have to say it'll work. <laughs> and then it's all up to the compilers to make that happen. In terms of the pre previous proposal, um, the standard basically said, a compiler can choose to support this or choose to not to, choose to not support it at all. And my understanding is that Microsoft compiler intended to say, you just have to always use the same assertion level everywhere. And everyone else basically said, that's crazy and will be horrible. We're going to need to support mixed modes in some way. Um, and the, we're working on a patch to GCC, which will hopefully get in there, which will at least basically support it. And to some extent, that basic support, because it's all embedded within a single function and you're not changing data structures, for the most part, the ODR violations that happen are not sort of critically bad. Like the worst case scenario is you thought you were getting one checking level, but you call a function with, that was compiled with a different one and you get a different checking level, which is okay. It's not the end of the world. So anything else? That's it. Thank you very much.